Realm presents Beatrix Green, Episode 9. A cool breeze, smelling of damp earth, beckoned from beyond the open door. James had given Beatrix leave to go. The house ushered her toward freedom with soothing whispers. Yes, yes, leave. There is nothing for you here. She glanced over her shoulder and caught James's anguished expression as he turned from her to the vision of his little brother, Tommy. In that moment, Beatrix saw what it cost to give himself up to the evil. How utterly alone he seemed. At her hesitation, the floor suddenly rippled under her feet, nearly tossing her toward the door. She threw out her arms to steady herself, anger flaring in her chest. She had never allowed anyone to force her to do anything against her will. And blast if this house tried to start that now. Go on, live, came the whispers, more insistent now. Or die where you stand. The threat was implicit. Beatrix had spent her whole life avoiding entanglements, watching out only for herself, keeping her heart safe from shattering ever again, as it had when her parents died. There was no future with James. She knew this. But this was James. James, who had spent his entire life fighting the evil that had destroyed his family who hadn't flinched when he saw her darkest secrets. James, who was infuriating and kind and stubborn and good. And now, by exploiting his grief and guilt, the house had broken him. But it hadn't broken her. And she was not the type of person who would abandon a friend. Beatrix straightened her spine lifted her chin and turned her back on the open door. The gaslights in the hall exploded. Leave. 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 Insistent voices of multiple men echoed frantically around her, emanating from the great dark mass that roiled before James. It oozed from the walls, pulsating with a rage and impatience that pressed in on her. Next to her. Behind her. Above her. The house thrummed and vibrated as if gathering energy. Pieces of plaster and brick flew off the walls. But Beatrix Green would not slink away like a whimpering dog with its tail between its legs. I am not leaving you, James, she announced with steel in her voice. The rightness of that decision cracked something open in her. I am not leaving, she repeated, and a strength she had not known she had rushed in, like taking the first big breath after releasing herself from a too tight corset. Shattered glass crunched under her feet as she walked toward him. The house shuddered. An enormous gilded mirror crashed to the ground. Beatrix, James said, his expression pained. You must go. No. She turned to look straight into the eyes of the force that pretended to be Tommy. You cannot have him. The little boy's eyes narrowed, and he tightened his grip on James's hand. You have made your choice. Enraged voices cried in unison as the door slammed behind her. And now you die like the last Lady Ashbury. No! James cried, moving toward Beatrix. Just as it had in the first seance, a hunting knife materialized in her hand. Memories of Lady Ashbury's final moments. The breathless panic, the hot, burbling agony of her slashed throat flooded her mind. The pull to lift the knife was strong, but Beatrix was stronger. With all her might, she threw the knife away from her. It plunged into the painted face of some Ashbury ancestor. She stood tall, unwavering. The fingers that had held the knife tingled as she realized she'd proven something. I am stronger than you. The truth of it, the wonder of it, caused a rush of power and light to flow through her, electrifying her. She filled her lungs with it, tilting her head back to drink it in. 
The glow spread throughout her body, sending her curls tumbling down her back, pins clattering to the floor. This was her power, the potential she had long tamped down to remain inconspicuous, unseen, safe. She released a breath and light flowed from her lips like soft, golden smoke. It pulsed through her, spreading out from her fingertips. She held one hand up in wonder, noticing how the darkness shrank away from it. She pushed both palms out, and the dark mass contracted further with a hiss. James watched, eyes wide and mouth open in awe. Beside him, the image of Tommy flickered, but not before throwing Beatrix a mutinous, fearful look. This is why the house wanted her to leave, wanted her to use the knife to destroy herself. It sensed she had the power to push back. Beatrix drew on that certainty. Wisps of light flickered around her, different from her own glow. What? What is that? James croaked. Beatrix did not know. The only thing she knew was that the dark disliked it, too. It hissed as the wisps of light resolved into images of people. A young woman with a flower crown, an old man dressed in his Sunday finest, a beloved grandmother whose cameo gleamed like a beacon at her throat. Some were translucent and airy, others barely winking to view at all. Ghosts. But they didn't scare Beatrix. Instead, she felt a strong sense of support, of comfort. More and more spirits surrounded her. Who are you? She asked, her voice thick with awe. Gentle whispers answered. He brought peace to my father. My mother could finally let go. You helped my son. Beatrix gasped. These were the ghosts whose family members she had comforted over the years. All this time, Beatrix had misconstrued her insights, their communications, as empathy. But she had been speaking with them all along. A waterlogged young man appeared before her, smiling sadly. Beatrix knew instantly who he was. The ghost of Mrs. Latham's son, Roger. I tried to warn you, the shimmering young man said. I should have listened, Beatrix replied. Thank you. Roger moved aside as one last ghost materialized before her. Oh, Amanda, Beatrix cried. She reached out, but her arms caught on the air. I am so sorry. Some of the other ghosts were faded impressions of their former selves, transparent and grey. But Amanda's image was achingly real, down to the fatal twist in her neck. She gave Beatrix one of her playful, sardonic grins. Amanda, James gasped from across the hall, so he could see them too. We're here to keep you safe, Amanda told Beatrix, her voice clear and strong. A great swell of gratitude filled her chest. She had chosen to fight an evil she didn't understand, an evil that used people for its own gain, and she would not be alone. What's happening? James asked, his eyes wide and confused. Slowly, Beatrix turned to him. I am. Holding a hand up to shield his eyes, James blinked rapidly, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. Beatrix seemed to expand before him. Light shone from her fingertips, from her hair as it tumbled down her back, from her mouth as her lips curled into a smile. She took his breath away. The muted image she so carefully created to shift attention away from herself fell from her like an old cloak pooling at her feet. He leaned toward her without even realizing it. Hope burned in his chest. Beatrix had stayed. She would stand with him. He was not entirely alone. His heart ached as he looked at Amanda, her head and neck still bent at a gruesome angle. 
She seemed so real for a desperate moment he thought she'd only been injured, that she wasn't dead. But he had seen Beatrix reach for her and find in nothingness. Amanda, I am so very sorry, he said to her spirit. I never meant for you to be hurt, for anything to happen to you. She turned, but she didn't look at him. Her gaze was locked on to his little brother beside him, and her expression was murderous. A cold dread squeezed his gut. Instinctually, James stepped in front of the boy. That's not Tommy, Beatrix stated, but he resisted her words. He wanted it to be his little brother. He didn't want to lose him again. It's a demon, Beatrix called, wearing your brother's face. At her words, Tommy's eyes flared red, then they returned to their usual soft blue. You won't leave me again, will you, Albie? Tommy said. But the disguise was fading. Great swathes of skin peeled off Tommy's face, revealing a snarling demon beast underneath. Thomas's image collapsed into a mass of snarling, hissing energy, black and shiny as onyx. But it still used Tommy's voice wailing in pain and begging for help, as though he had been swallowed by the darkness. It made James want to dive in after him, but it wasn't him. It wasn't him. The child's cries faded, contorted faces punched through the molten blackness like skulls pushing through clay. Their mouths moved, wheedling and shrieking. What do you want from me? He roared at the caves. The voices of men, all speaking at once, responded. Join us. Accept your rightful place. James looked wildly at Beatrice. She was a few paces away, her presence forcing the shadows to cower around her. But they continued reaching for him. One voice made James's head snap up in dismay. Come, son. Step into your legacy. His father. It's not real, do not listen to it, Beatrix warned. Sparks shot from the swirling mass, sending both James and Beatrix reeling back. The room pulsed with rage. It was the rage he remembered seeing when his mother questioned his father, when anyone questioned the lord of the manor. More and more twisted, undead faces pushed through the molten blackness, their howling mouths working even faster. Beatrix straightened and, to his astonishment, laughed. <laughs> oh my, you don't like it when a woman dares defy you, do you? She said as her ghosts whirled faster around her. You dare listen to her? A mere girl. Who does she think she is? A whore. Ridiculous. Incapable. Stop, James yelled. He stepped in front of Beatrix as the gaunt, empty-eyed faces pushed ever closer to them, spitting cruelties and snapping their jaws. His father's voice boomed loudest of all. Foolish, inconsequential, an embarrassment. James closed his eyes. That was what his father used to spit at his mother when he worked himself into a violent rage. Finally, James understood the molten mass of evil for what it was, the venom of centuries of men who demanded unquestioning obedience from everyone. It was their soul-poisoning arrogance, their belief that unfettered power and domination shielded them from consequences. That was the true Ashbury legacy. It corrupted his father and now it wanted him. But his mother had wanted something else for her boys. She threatened that legacy, so they forced her to cut her own throat. A jolt of fear shot through him. Beatrix. But the house had already tried to punish her for her defiance, and she resisted it. His gaze flicked to the hunting knife still stuck in the painting of an ancestor. The voices grew louder, wheedling and insistent, drowning out his own thoughts. Step into your rightful role. Do not disappoint us. You were born for this. You earned it. 
James put his hands over his ears, but still the voices persisted. How many others must die like your mother before you take what is rightfully yours? This legacy is yours by blood right. It is your legacy. Your legacy. More faces punched through the molten mess like hydra heads rising from muck. And God forgive him. A part of James wanted to give in to the court. Beatrix watched as James grabbed at his head, trying to shut out the voices. Fight it, James, she urged. Her voice rang out clearly, and James staggered, blinking at her as if he had forgotten she was there. They are lying to you, she said steadily. You are not like them. Don't give in. Amanda Reynolds floated before James. Here, her presence seemed to say is what comes of all that unchecked power, violence and death. James's face twisted in anguish, and in that moment, Beatrix knew he blamed himself for Amanda's death. The seething energy suddenly changed. It smoothed itself out, becoming slick like oil. It was tamping down the rage, changing tactics. Do not deny us. An elegant male voice announced calmly. Beatrix frowned. She didn't like this new tone. James swiveled toward the warm tenor. He seemed to recognize the voice and the shape of the aged face. Something pushed through the mass of blackness and clattered to the ground at James's feet. It was the ancient family signet ring. Despite their efforts to burn it, the gold gleamed with an unnatural shine the white around the onyx trapping the scorpion inside the evil, unblinking eye. Take it, the elegant voice urged. It is yours by right. Beatrix moved toward the ring, preparing to throw it back when James put an arm out to stop her, his eyes never leaving the ring. She stared at him, surprised. The look on his face was unnerving. But when the ghosts moved to block her as well, she understood. James had to make the choice. Otherwise, the lure of what they promised would haunt him forever, calling him to return to his rightful place as one of the ruthless rulers of society. She watched as James stood over the ring, impossibly still. The voice of his beloved grandfather confused James. He remembered a tall figure with a huge white handlebar moustache, a man with an endless stash of treats in his pockets who told him stories and tussled his hair. He had not been an evil or cruel man. Perhaps, perhaps a man could wear the ring and not succumb to darkness. Maybe it was the nature of the man who controlled this force. What if he could contain it? Maybe even use it for good? Yes, of course, you can control it. He stepped closer. James, Beatrix called. He turned to look at her. Her eyes were steady on his. Gold light limbed her form. James, she said again, softly this time. It killed Tommy. It killed your mother. I must know, James said slowly. Do they have Thomas? Is he with them? He held his breath, waiting for the answer. Beatrix closed her eyes. No, she said. He long ago found peace. And tonight your mother joined him. James released his breath. His brother and his mother were free. He knelt and picked up the ancient ring, turning it over in his hands, inspecting it closely. How easy it would be to slip it on, to stop fighting. He closed his hand over it. Yes, yes, the voices purred. No, he roared, and in one swift motion, James hurled it into the evil's dark maw. The molten mass swallowed the ring. The house gave a massive lurch. 
Doors rattled, the floor rolled as if an underground beast bucked beneath it. James turned to Beatrix, and she gave him a smile of such dazzling relief and sweetness, his heart stuttered. A chandelier crashed down from the ceiling beside him. Paintings flew off the walls. Windows cracked in their frames. James held a hand out to Beatrix and she clasped it. Relief such as Beatrix had never known flooded through her. James had rejected the pull of evil. He would not become another cruel portrait lining the halls of this house. The house seethed and crashed down around them because it had been denied. Tendrils of fire snaked up the heavy drapery as they dashed for the front door. Let's get the hell out of here, no- James began, but he was violently jerked back. His hand flew from hers. Serpentine arms stretched from the molten ooze, wrapping around his wrists and ankles, dragging him back. If it could not use James, it would devour him. James screamed as he was dragged backward, and Beatrix was reminded horribly, viscerally, of Stanhope. Something inside Beatrix unleashed. She raised her arms, and light burst from her hands, cleaving the darkness. Her ghosts surrounded her, placing their palms on her shoulders and back. Beatrix gasped, expecting cold, but instead felt a rushing warmth and energy flow through her. The gathering spirits strengthened and channeled her light, and the room flared with sudden brightness. The ghost of Amanda Reynolds stepped in front of her and placed one hand over Beatrix's heart. She extended the other out to the molten ooze, and, like a magnet pulling a sea of iron filings, Amanda dragged it away from James, giving him the opening to break free. He scrambled away, even as the darkness shook Amanda off and surged after him. Still, it could not breach the flaring light emanating from Beatrix and her ghost. Beatrix helped James to his feet. The ewes frothed and spit, recoiling and surging with growing frenzy. Beatrix knew it would attack again. It just needed an opening. Amanda disappeared, and some of the more transparent ghosts winked out of view, as if drained. Still, Beatrix's light held firm. James straightened and his fury was palpable. Their eyes locked. No more, James told her steadily. No more, Beatrix echoed. She stretched out her hand and James grasped it. Together they turned to face the darkness. It was time to fight back, to destroy this force that wanted to destroy James. Beatrix closed her eyes, drawing on something deep within her. She pulled from a reservoir of light, from the remaining ghosts around her, from James's hand in her own. Light exploded out of her. The darkness rolled back, a frothing surge of fury, preparing to drown them in a tidal wave of rage. Beatrix squeezed James's hand and thought, for Amanda. She closed her eyes and sent another surge of light directly into the center of the molten evil. It hit with bolts of red lightning that snapped and crackled throughout the mass. Distant howls of agony split the air. Spidery veins of lightning moved through it and sent sparks flying. One hit a velvet chair. Another fell on a rug. Both went up in flames. Heat surged around them as the curtains caught. The giant family crest over the mantle crashed to the ground. Beatrix stood firm. Sweat beaded on her brow, but her light never wavered as it beat back that which wanted to control, to dominate the world and people like her. No more. Her light created another hissing bolt of red lightning within the darkness, and the evil gave one final screech. And then it was gone. A deep, pressurized silence pressed on her ears. Everything slowed as she turned to James. An invisible pull dragged at her feet, reminding her of a wave rushing out to sea while she stood firm on the sand. Sound rushed back as their eyes met. A soft lavender light streamed in from the shattered windows, chasing away the heavy darkness that had oppressed them. 
they had survived the long, terrible night. James coughed. The room was filling with black smoke. Fire sizzled up the walls. Plaster and brick crumbled around them. A ceiling beam crashed. We have to leave, James said in her ear. Now. The overwhelming heat felt like a living thing. The roaring, snapping, and cracking of the fire sounded like the bones breaking. Flames licked at their feet as James pulled Beatrix away. Their eyes burned in the thick black smoke. He dragged her outside the front door and into the fresh air. Away from the violent roar of the house, devouring itself. James led Beatrix onto the lawn and they ran. When they were safely away from the growing inferno, they paused, taking long, shuddering breaths, coughing the smoke from their lungs. James looked back at the house and gaped. The entire structure was alight with a strange, savage glow. The purpling light of the dawn gave the plumes of red and orange flames twisting around each other a nightmarish feel. Its unearthly roar blocked out all other sounds. Good riddance. As they neared outside the gates, James noticed people running toward them. A man's black frock and a woman with a red choker brought a frisson of recognition. The barkers and tourists at the gates. They must have camped nearby. It resented them earlier, but now he felt a pang of gratitude. Their sudden and unexpected kindness was a balm after the house's unrelenting evil. Is everyone out? Someone called. James paused, eyes wide. Harry left to find Dr. Doyle, Beatrix reminded him as if sensing his momentary panic. He is safe. James released a breath. He couldn't have borne the responsibility for any more deaths. We're pumping water from the well, a man cried, carrying a water bucket as he ran toward the house. We need every able-bodied man. James blinked blearily, clearing his eyes of the smoke. He shook his head in bemusement. Despite everything, they still wanted to save the cursed house. Let it burn, James shouted into the door. He led Beatrix to a small garden near the gates and bade her sit on an old marble bench. Two men who had been running with sloshing buckets stopped abruptly and stared dumbfounded at the blazing inferno. How did it go up so fast? One of the men muttered. We spied the first flames only moments ago. It would appear ancient evil burns more vigorously than ordinary fire, James said ruefully to Beatrix. When she did not respond, he sat beside her and raised her chin. Beatrix, are you all right? She blinked up at him. I am suddenly quite drained. James's heart constricted. A bit of soot smudged her cheek and he wiped at it with his thumb. You did it, Beatrix Green. You saved me, he said quietly. And it was true. Without her, he couldn't have discovered the truth of his mother's death. Beatrix looked up at him with a soft smile. You are worth saving. James bent his head to kiss the corner of that smiling mouth. She leaned into him and rested her head on his shoulder. James pulled Beatrix hard against him. They sat quietly for a moment, listening to the roar of the fire, the splintering of wood, the collapsing of walls. Finally, he murmured, Did? Did you know you could do that? Beatrix gave a smoky laugh and kissed his throat before pulling away to look up at him. Do what? What happened back there? The light, the ghosts. Already it feels like a strange dream. Beatrix nodded. I did not know I was capable of conjuring light. It appeared the moment I let go and decided to fight. It was as if a veil had been removed. I do not know how better to explain it than that. Yet you managed to control it. She looked away, eyes suddenly distant. Yes, it appears so. You are a marvel, he said, kissing her forehead. 
For a moment, they sat in the silence. His mind was full of all that they had seen that night. The scorpion ring glaring up at him. Stanhope's mutilation. Amanda suspended in midair. Oh, God. James breathed. I will never forgive myself for Amanda's death. It was not your fault, Beatrix said. If there is anyone to blame, it is Lord Stanhope. He unleashed the evil. James groaned. Stanhope. I never guessed that he would. Would. Betray you and attempt to destroy us all for his own gain. You cannot blame yourself for that. But what was it? Where did it come from? James asked softly, almost to himself. Beatrix sighed. Stanhope was right about places of power. She said, They exist naturally, but can also be created. What do you mean? You told me the house had been built over a site of mass murder, when the Romans massacred an entire Celtic village, that their very bones were used to build the foundation, and that the house had its own pit of bodies. Perhaps so much suffering and blood had somehow tainted everything. It must have expressed itself through the science of your bloodline, waiting in the pit for the next heir to take up the mantle. Beatrix finished. The sounds of clattering horses reached their ears over the roar of the fire, and an out-of-control carriage careened through the gate and came to an abrupt halt. Someone leaped out of it. No, no, no! A panicked voice cried out. Beatrix! Beatrix! Harry! Harry, I'm here, Beatrix called, jumping up and moving toward the gate. A blur caught her up and whirled her around. Harry, he put her down and held her by the shoulders. Beatrix, oh, my friend, Harry cried. I saw the fire from the pub and I thought I'd lost you. We got out in time, she said, her throat growing tight with relief that Haz had not been there to witness what happened, that he stood before her reeking of ale, and eyes brimming with relief at finding her unhurt. Harry nodded to James, then looked around wildly. Amanda? I mean, Mrs. Reynolds. Where is she? Beatrix put a hand to his cheek to steady him and forced him to look at her. Amanda did not make it, she said. Neither did Stanhope. What? Harry cried. Both died in the fire. Beatrix exchanged a look with James. There was no way to describe precisely what had happened to Amanda and Stanhope. It was best to let everyone believe that they'd succumbed to the fire. She would tell Harry later, out of earshot from onlookers. Oh no. What a loss, Has said, eyes wide with shock. I must get word to her husband, James said heavily, clearly dreading the task, as well as to Stanhope's family. Harry sagged unexpectedly. I am suddenly feeling quite ill, he said. It must be from the panic of thinking I'd lost you, B, and learning about Mrs. Reynolds. He trailed off. And not at all because you've been drinking for hours in a pub, Beatrix thought. A surge of affection for her old friend tightened her throat again. Is Doyle with you? asked James. Has shook his head. He retired to his room at the inn many pints ago. Together they led Harry back to the carriage. I should return with him, Beatrix said after they helped Harry onto the leather seats, whereupon he instantly fell asleep. Before you go, may I speak with you? James asked. When she hesitated, he led her by the hand away from the carriage and into the shadow of a copse of trees. Beatrix, he began, and then faltered, squeezing her hand. Beatrix's heart stuttered in her chest. She didn't want to hear him say the words aloud. I know we agreed that our liaison is never to be repeated, she finished for him. It is best we honor that agreement. You need not worry. James blinked. 
That is... that is what you wish. He seemed suddenly unsure of himself, nervous even. His estate might have burned, but he was still a lord, a baronet, and Beatrix was still the daughter of actors, a woman of the working class, and now a real medium to complicate matters. It was better they went their separate ways, because they could never be together, because he was leaving for America, because she wouldn't allow him to shatter her heart. I want you to know that amidst all this horror, she replied, you gave me peace, and I will never forget it. A shadow stole over his face and he looked down suddenly, breaking eye contact. Beatrix longed to reach out and stroke his cheek. She clenched her fists at her side. With a sigh, James looked up at her again, an indefinable look in his eyes. I shall never be able to thank you adequately for all that you have done for me, Miss Green. It has been an honor to work with you. Slowly, he raised her hand to his lips and kissed it. He looked up at her, his lips still just inches from her skin. Goodbye, Miss Green. Before she could respond, he dropped her hand, turned and stiffly walked away from her into the strange light of the smoky dawn. Goodbye, Mr. Walker. James. Several weeks later, James hadn't expected the Royal Victoria dock to be this crowded. Men, women and children jostled him as they pushed to get closer to the gangplank, despite a chain blocking off the entrance. The sign explained that first-class passengers on the White Line steamship to New York would be boarded within the hour. He shouldered his way to a relatively open corner of the covered waiting area with a great deal of, excuse me madams, and pardon me sirs. He had hoped to already be in America by now, but the inquiries into the deaths of Mrs. Reynolds and Stanhope, as well as insurance complications over the destruction of his home, kept him tied to London longer than he had expected. And yet all the delays and complications pale in comparison to the constant dull ache of not seeing Beatrix Green again. James adjusted his gloves and frowned. He had respected her wishes, of course, and not called on her after their final goodbye. He remembered looking at her that night, soot-stained and beautiful. He had wanted to kiss her desperately. He had wanted to tell her that he did not want it to be goodbye. He could not get her out of his mind. He ricocheted between urging himself to storm her small quarters and talk sense into her. Why shouldn't they enjoy each other's company while he remained in London? to grimly accepting that she had been right. It was best that they left the impossible situation alone. James shook his head, wishing he felt more excited about leaving London. But it meant leaving her and any hope of reconciliation behind too. The crowd was left parted, hushing in a way that made him wonder if one of the lesser royals or someone from Parliament was also travelling on his steamship. No, it was a woman. She wore a tailored ruby-red walking suit with a hemline that shockingly ended above the ankle in the modern fashion. When his gaze reached the woman's face, James froze. Beatrix Green? His heart raced with confusion. What was she doing there? He didn't dare hope that she had come to see him off. She did not appear to be searching for anyone. She held her chin high as she walked toward the loading plank entrance. She still seemed to emit a light, like she had that night at Ashbury Manor. He watched as heads turned to gaze at her with quiet admiration. James adjusted his hat and smoothed his chest. Would she be pleased to see him? He could not predict. All he knew was that he was thrilled to see her, and this time he would let her know. Beatrix smiled to herself as she navigated the crowded dock, thinking of Harry. They had said their final goodbyes that morning, and her old friend managed to surprise her yet again. 
I have something for you, he'd said as the driver loaded her trunks into the carriage. As you did not need to. I know, I know, he'd said. But I worry about you. Harry made a hand gesture to hurry her along, and Beatrix lifted the lid. Ensconced in red velvet was... a pewter cone. She tilted her head and looked up at him. It, it's lovely, he has, but... Um... What is it? Harry's eyes shone with excitement. It's a spirit trumpet. Beatrix inspected it and bit her lip to keep from laughing. She'd heard of them, of course. Some spiritualists claimed they amplified the quiet voices of shy spirits, like a megaphone. She put a hand on her friend's arm. You do know I can hear spirits very clearly now. Since her experience at Ashbury Manor, Beatrix had been able to access the spirit realm with great ease, and her business had thrived as a result. Despite the pain of losing James, she treasured that night as a turning point in her life, the night she finally embraced her abilities. Had it not been for James, she would still be tamping herself down and hiding. Now, as her knowledge and skills grew, her inner strength radiated out as natural confidence. People treated her differently. Respected scions of the spiritualist movement sought her out. Articles had been written about her, and they led to an invitation and a job offer in America, which now had her leaving her old life behind for good. Harry tapped the metal. Yes, but you will be so far away. What if you cannot hear them all the way across the pond? Beatrix rose on her toes and pecked him on the cheek. It is a lovely, thoughtful gift, Has. Thank you. Harry squeezed her hands. I will miss you, my friend. Are you sure I cannot convince you to join me? America is the land of new beginnings, you know. He had shrugged. Perhaps one day. Perhaps sooner than you think, Has, she thought, smiling. She had no doubt his curiosity would eventually win out. The crowds thickened as Beatrix neared the loading dock. The ticket master had promised boarding would commence at any moment. America was where the most exciting spiritualist researchers and thinkers gathered, she reminded herself as she looked to her new life. And thanks to this opportunity, she would be among them. There was a time she couldn't have imagined making a move this big. Couldn't have imagined leaving her small flat, her old friends and her old life. And yes... She'd be lying to herself if she didn't admit she sometimes imagined crossing paths with James in America. But he was long gone, and she knew not where. Nor would he be able to locate her if he ever found himself back in London. That door was firmly closed. A tall man stepped in front of her and blocked her way. She huffed and made to go around him when a familiar voice stopped her cold. You are here. Beatrix looked up into the face she thought she'd never see again. Her heart swelled and stuttered at the same time. How did he do that to her, even after all this time? James Ashbury grinned down at her, his blue eyes shining. His look of surprise and delight was so outside of his normally stiff, superior manner that Beatrix blinked twice to make sure she wasn't mistaken. James... Uh, Lord Ashbury... I thought you were already in America. Legal delays, I am afraid. And so my journey commences today, he said. And you? Are you here to see someone off? No. I too am travelling to New York, she said, pointing out the porter behind her carrying her cases. What a coincidence, he said, his eyes crinkling. Tell me, what is bringing you to the new world? Coincidence indeed. Beatrix had felt compelled to book this particular liner on this particular day. A soft, ghostly chuckle that sounded suspiciously like Amanda confirmed her suspicion. She shook her head in amazement. James Walker Ashbury was standing before her. 
I have been invited to lecture at the Casadega Lake Free Association in upstate New York, she said, glad her voice stayed steady. I declined originally, but they sweetened the offer and, well, something compelled me to pursue this adventure. She flicked her gaze to the buzzing energy on her right. How did they come to know about you? James asked. Beatrix shrugged. It appears the world of spiritualists is quite small, and word of your tremendous talent has spread, I am sure, he said, leaning closer. Beatrix's heart leaped, and she swallowed hard at his nearness. I suspect a particular patron may have had a hand in respectfully spreading word of my abilities, Beatrix said, giving him a meaningful look. He smiled in return. Tell me. What subject will you lecture? He continued, the low timbre of his voice sending a thrum through her. Beatrix paused, willing herself not to lean forward and press her mouth to his warm neck. The association is devoted to the study of science and spiritualism, she managed, surprised to realize that they had begun to whisper, to move even closer to each other. They promised me the freedom to develop my own curriculum once I confer with other lecturers. The study of science and spiritualism, he repeated. How interesting. With your experience as Dr. Walker, perhaps I may impose upon you to lecture on the side of science for stubborn non-believers, Beatrix said with a teasing smile. James grinned down at her and she held his gaze. Calls for first-class passengers echoed through the overhang. Someone jostled Beatrix and James took her elbow to steady her. He did not release her. Beatrix raised an eyebrow, suppressing a grin when he traced his fingers along the sensitive skin at her wrist. How had she waited this long to feel his touch again? Staring into her eyes, he took her hand and lifted it to his mouth for a kiss. I should be honored to join you in any manner you desire, James said, but I must warn you, my beliefs have been quite transformed of late, especially one in particular. Oh, and what is that? Beatrix asked. Above all, I believe, he said, his lips lingering on her hand, in the extraordinary brilliance of Beatrix Green. The End You're listening to Beatrix Green, narrated by Sharomi Arsario and Alistair Austin. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Beatrix Green is written by Rachel Hawkins, Ash Parsons, and Vicki Alviar Schechter. It is produced by Haley Wagreich and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith, with additional editing by Kaylin West.